Uh, specifically, we are looking only at a, a very certain kind of PDE uh, right now. Uh, it's a lot easier to do this if you only have one spatial dimension. So we're just looking at x, a, a spatial derivative in x. So it's a one-dimensional system. Um, and we are only looking at like diffusion. There's no convection where you might have a first derivative in x. So on the left-hand side of the equation, we will have a first derivative in t. And on the right side of the equation, we're going to have a second derivative in x. And this kind of equation is called a parabolic equation. Um, just because, I don't know, a parabolic equation of y equals x squared this is like t and then x squared. Uh, I don't know. That's why they call it that, I guess. So this is what it looks like. So we have uh, a d u. Uh, I'm going to have my, um, my state variable, in this case, be the letter u. So du dt is equal to, I should say partial of u with respect to t, is equal to our diffusivity, capital D sub u times a partial, the second partial of u with respect to x. And I'm going to have some sort of like uh, function here, which contains reactions. And this function f might be a function of, uh, usually it's not a function of t. It could be. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll put it in there. It could be t, x, could be the variable u, could be a function of the variable uh, v, which we haven't written yet, could be a function of the variable w, or however many state variables you have. Now that's uh, a one component system. You might have multiple components in your system. And so you might have a partial of another variable, say v, with respect to t, equaling to the diffusivity of v, times the second partial of v with respect to x, plus a different function, g, which is a function of t, x, u, v, w, etc. And there might be another component to your system, like partial of w with respect to t, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why, okay, so if you compare this to the way I formulated the ODE system, I didn't call our state variables u, v, and w. I called them y1, y2, y3, dot, dot, dot. And when you put them all together, they form a vector called capital Y. Um, it's going to get super confusing if I call my state variables y1, y2, y3. Because at some point, these are now functions of x as well as time, right? And at some point, when we're going to discretize space, the value of u at each point in space is going to be u1, u2, u3, et cetera. So I just wanted to, to, to get away from the, the indexing for our state variables before we even discretize space. Okay, so note that these PDEs uh, in space, They are one-dimensional, right? So it's just an x. We don't have uh, another spatial variable. We don't have y or z. Um, we don't have, you know, this is Cartesian, um, but you could, I suppose, formulate these with uh, spherical or cylindrical coordinates or prolate spheroid coordinates or whatever you wanted. Um, right, so they're 1d and x, and you only have the second derivative. Right, so we're not looking at convection or anything else like that. And of course, boundary conditions are an important part of this sort of problem. Uh, you, could, you could set up general boundary conditions, but at least in this lecture, we are only going to concern ourselves with boundary conditions that have flux. So we have something like minus d partial u with respect to x evaluated at x equals a. Oh, I should have said that. Um, I don't know if I wrote anywhere on here in my notes. But this 1D spatial dimension, x, is between uh, a and b, right? On an interval, a, a goes from a to b. Okay, so our flux, du dx, evaluated at x equals a, is equal to some q, which could be a function of t, u. Um, if it's a function of u, it's probably a function of u only at x equals a, v, at x equals a, dot, dot, dot. And that's sort of general if we have a flux being constrained to something. Specific example of this could be the flux is equal to zero, right? That's a no flux. Or it could be equal to some constant q, which is not a function of things, right? That's a constant flux. 
But more generally, you have Q as a function of, of these other variables. Okay, so how are we going to approach this in MATLAB? There, MATLAB does have solvers, like ODE15S, but for PDEs. But for, for me personally, I think those PDE solvers are overly complicated. And most of the time, we don't need all of the complicatedness of those PDE solvers. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to discretize space. So x here, instead of a continuous variable here, we're going to call x to be this, um, this vector. And x is going to be the first point in this vector is a, which is the, the leftmost point in x. And the second point is a plus some delta x, which we're, in this case we're going to call h. And the third point is a plus 2h dot, 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 all the way up to the final point in the vector, which is just b. And you could have x be a row vector or a column vector. So I'm just going to put a little superscript t there, which means that x is actually a column vector. It's transpose of this row vector that we wrote. Another way that we could label this is that the first point in x is x1, the second point in x is x2, the third point in x is x3, dot, 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 all the way to the final point in x, which is x sub capital N. Now, if we discretize space this way for the spatial variable, that also means we should discretize our state variables. So u, instead of just being a u as a function of x, it's a vector which is equal to u evaluated at x equals a, u evaluated at x equals a plus h, dot, 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 all the way up to u evaluated at x equals b. And u definitely is a column vector, so I'm going to put transpose there. It's easier to write them as row vectors, just because the way we write, but I mean, this is a column vector. You should know that in your head. Okay. And again, just like x, we can also index this with you know, the first point, or the first element of the u vector is u1, then you have u2, all the way up to u sub capital N. Okay, so we're going to exchange our, our, our idea of u, v, w, the state variables to be continuum variables in space to now being discretized variables with endpoints in, in endpoints in space. But to do that, to, to, to make this work, we have to now take our second derivative in space and discretize that as well. Right? So we're going to do something called finite differences. So the first thing to note is that the first derivative, sorry, the second derivative, is the first derivative of the first derivative. So our partial squared u with respect to x is equal to the partial with respect to x of the partial of u with respect to x. And the reason why is we're going to use this, this, um, this point to show us how to discretize the second derivative. Because I think you guys are probably all familiar with using finite differences to discretize a first derivative. But how do you do it for a second derivative? And we're going to use something called central differences. So there, there's multiple different ways you could do it. Uh, you could approximate. So let's say you want, uh, you want to approximate the first derivative at a particular point. You could approximate it by using forward differences, like the difference between those two points. I'm going to circle the point we want to, to evaluate the derivative at. You could approximate it with a forward difference. You could approximate it with a backward difference by looking at the current point and the previous point. Or you could pro approximate it by central differences, which skips the middle point and only looks at the two points on either side. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do central differences. Okay. So what that means is our, um, our first derivative of the first derivative evaluated at the point xi, some, some point anywhere in, in space or in our spatial vector, is approximately equal to, I hope I've given myself enough room, it's approximately equal to the partial of u with respect to x evaluated at xi 
plus one half h minus the partial of u with respect to x evaluated at xi minus one half h. So I've gone one half h in either direction on either side of my point xi. And then of course that has to be d divided by the difference between those two points, which is just h. Okay, so this works well as long as h is small. Right, if h is too big, then it's not a good approximation. X, h has to be very small. Um, and so this is a good approximation. It's a central difference approximation uh, for the, der the, the second derivative at the point xi. So we're using uh, an approximation in the first derivative to get the second derivative approximation. Okay, so we're going to look at this first one here, and we're going to approximate that now again. Right, so this, this first term in the approximation for the second derivative itself is a first derivative, and that is approximately equal to u at xi plus h minus u at xi. So again, we're doing central differences around the point xi plus a half h. divided by h. And the second term in the approximation for the second derivative, that's u evaluated xi minus u evaluated xi minus h all over h. So in the first step, we went a half h in either direction. And the second step, we did that again. And so now we don't have half h's anymore. We're at, we're at full h's, right? So xi plus h, that's the same thing as x sub i plus 1. And xi minus h, that's the same thing as x sub, I should write this, write this down, x sub i minus 1. Right? x sub i minus 1. x sub i plus 1. Okay, so putting this all together, now that we've approximated the first derivative kind of three different times, uh, we get the approximation of the second derivative finally. So the second derivative approximation evaluated at xi is equal to u i plus 1 minus 2 u i plus u i minus 1 all over h squared. And if we had multiple components, this, the approximation would look the same. For each one of those. Now this is one way to look at this. One way to look at this is saying, here's a formula for approximating the second derivative. Another way to look at it, which is kind of the same thing, but it's a little bit approaching it from a different direction, which is, if I have this vector of u's, then I can use this formula to approximate the second derivative by calculating it. Does that make sense? Like, it, going the way, the direction we did, we, we're, we're replacing something analytical with some formula. The other direction I'm saying, if you actually have numbers, you can calculate it with this formula. Anyway, uh, just a different way to look at it. Okay, so if, so if we discretize uh, space this way, then our PDE in U changes into a series of ODEs now. So now we have a series of ODEs where now it's, it's real D instead of the partial. D U vector DT is equal to the diffusivity DU times some matrix, which I'm going to call P. And I'm going to show you that it's a matrix by putting two underlines times a vector U plus 
instead of f like a continuous function f, it is now a vector f of all the different points, which is a function of t again, potentially, potentially a function of x, function of u, vector u, vector v, let me erase these so they look better, vector v, vector w, dot, 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 however many components you might have. And the only kind of mysterious thing about this is this matrix P. This is a matrix that represents the discretized second derivative. So in the same way that when we had a series of ODEs, we could put it into matrix format, into vector slash matrix format. Let me go back actually to the last lecture's notes here on that. And it's like way up at the top. Where here we had a vector dy dt equals to f some function, some vector valued function of t and the state variable y. And, and so this is a vector valued system of equations, right? So each row represented a different equation. The first one was the equation for dy, dy1 dt. The second row is the equation for dy2 dt, etc. However, each one of these equations is, uh, well, they could be coupled together, actually. They could be coupled together. But now, when we go over to our PDEs, each row in this equation represents a different point in space. And the only way that these points in space are coupled, usually, is through this matrix. So if I look at this, at this vector F here, each row in F only contains terms for that particular point in space. The only way that points in space are coupled to each other, the only way that ui plus 1 is going to show up in ui's equation is through this matrix term here. Okay, so we'll see that in just a little bit. Okay, and I know we only have seven minutes of class left. So because we had to finish up last lecture, we're a little bit behind, and that's fine. Uh, we'll get as far as we can uh, in this part of class. Okay, so we want to be able to convert this into MATLAB format. We want to know essentially what we're working towards here is two things. One, how do we represent this matrix P? What is actually in this matrix P? And how do we take our boundary conditions and account for those in our equations? So those are two things that we're going to try here. The first part, the first one is the easiest part. We are going to look at an individual equation. We're going to look at the, basically the ith row, the ith row of, of this equation here. Okay, so at that point in space, xi, then our equation is d u sub i dt. So this is the, the, how the ith point, the u at the ith point in space changes in time, is equal to our diffusivity times our discretized second derivative u i plus 1 minus 2 u i plus u i minus 1 all over h squared plus the i throw of f, fi. And the i throw of f is a function of t, the i th point in space of u, the i th point in space of v, of w, etc. So you can see now, I've written out explicitly, that the i th row of f only depends on the i th points in space of our state variables. So I don't have a ui plus 1 or a un or anything else like that in here. It's only sub i's here. So again, the only way that different points in space show up in this equation is through this term here, the diffusion term, which will eventually become our matrix P. Okay, so if this is what our, um, our equation for the ith point in space is, 
then we can use this to formulate what is the ith row of p. So the ith row of p, which I'm going to um, denote here by p sub bracket i. I don't know, that, that's not necessarily like standard notation. I just had to, had to come up with something to, to show that this is the ith row, not just the ith element, it's the whole row, um, is equal to a whole bunch of zeros, a whole bunch of leading zeros, and finally, you get to the point where you're running into non-zero terms. The first non-zero term is 1 over h squared. The second non-zero term is negative 2 over h squared. And the third non-zero term is 1 over h squared again. And then you have a whole bunch of trailing zeros. to annotate this just a little bit here. This is the ith column. Of the ith row. And the other columns on either side are the i plus first or i plus once column. And the i minus once column. So P ends up being a square matrix, and on this main diagonal, in, in the ith row, ith column, for any i, you have this term, negative 2 over h squared. It, it makes sense, right? So these are the, these are the coefficients of ui minus 1, ui, and ui plus 1 in our, in our equation. That's why they're showing up. And there's no other U, UIs anywhere in here. There's no UI minus 2, no UI plus 2, and so that's why everything else in this row is 0. So you get these three terms, these three coefficients in our i row of P. Okay, so that's our equation for the i point in space. And that was the easy one. So we, we got that, um, but this is the, the bulk of our matrix. Almost every single row of our matrix is going to look like this. The only two rows that won't look like this are the first row and the last row, because those are the rows where we're going to have to start dealing with boundary conditions and other weird things are, are popping up. So let's deal with these two uh, boundary rows. The first one we're going to row, uh, look at is i equals 1 row. And I think we're going to get a little way into this, and then we're going to stop for today. Okay, so the i equals 1 row looks like the following. You have du1 dt. DU, let's try this again. DU1 DT is equal to diffusivity D sub U times U2 minus 2 U1 plus, now this last term here inside the diffusivity, the discretization of the diffusivity, sorry, the diffusion, is usually UI minus 1, but I equal, equals 1. So this is u0. But u0 doesn't exist. It's outside our bounds. So I'm going to put little quotes around u0, because I'm putting it there, but we know it's not a real thing. Divided by h squared, that's our diffusion term, plus everything else is just normal. You have f1 of t comma u1, v1, w1, etc. Okay, so the main thing that we're going to do now is we have to figure out what is this fake term that we put in here, this u0 that doesn't exist. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the boundary conditions to determine what is u0. And that's the, the, main, the main way that boundary conditions will enter into our equation. That's the only way. Um, and that's really the only weird thing about the row i equals 1 and the row i equals capital N. Okay, so when we pick this back up on Wednesday, we're going to start here. We're going to say, how do we use our boundary conditions to figure out what is this fake term, u0? And it's going to be the same idea in both the boundaries. And we're going to get the same answer. Uh, so we're going to end up with a, a pretty straightforward general formula, as long as we have a problem that looks like this, where you have the flux being constrained to something at our boundaries. Okay, so with that, I will see you guys on Wednesday.